Well, good morning, Oakwood, and welcome to part six of our series called Witness. We're glad you're here uh, with us this morning, even though uh, the, uh, the driving conditions were challenging overnight. And early this morning, glad that you are here uh, with us this morning. Uh, it, it is a great time to uh, just, just kind of talk about the worship set just a little bit, because there's so many themes from the worship this morning that we're going to be talking about in the message today, and that freedom from sin that we can have, that freedom that is only offered through the grace of Jesus Christ but also the fact that we can live holy and righteous lives because of what Jesus did for us. And that's really kind of uh, going with the theme of the, of the message this morning. As the title of today's message is Nail the Sins That Slay You. Nail the Sins That Slay You. Because that's a part of our witness. Is that we would be pure, as we would be holy, as we would be righteous as God's children. And be the ones that are living our lives to be a reflection of light into the darkness of the world. So let's, let's begin this morning as we have every week uh, this year and just, just uh, pause for a moment, bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want you to pray this morning, Lord, today speak to me and expect him to speak to you in a special way this morning. And all God's people said, amen, and we expect that this morning as we uh, came into this series called Witness, uh, we talked about Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where uh, Jesus passes that mission of the Great Commission on, and he says, you will be my witnesses. And we were talking about what that meant and what the mission was, and, and here in the last few weeks as we end the series, we're going to be learning about more about the how. How do we do that? How do we live our lives as witnesses uh, for Jesus Christ? And we're going to be looking at the book of Colossians this morning. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn there to Colossians chapter 3. If you didn't bring your Bible, you can grab the one that's right there around you in your seat and turn it to page 984. And you'll be right there at Colossians 3, and as always, you can follow along in the app. All the scriptures and the sermon points and all that are, is right there for you. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to read uh, the first uh, 17 verses of that chapter. And this is talking about our new life in Jesus Christ. Uh, he, uh, the, the writer, um, uh, which is a letter of Paul to the Colossians, as he's been writing in, in chapter 2, he was talking about the new life in Christ. He's really sharing the gospel and talking about how we're alive in Christ. And, and then you kind of get to chapter 3, and it's one of those chapters that has a lot of therefores. Because of what Jesus has done, therefore do this. Because of who Christ is and because you call him Savior and Lord, therefore do this. And so let's read this together and, and, and let, the, let the word of the Lord speak to us this morning. This is what it says. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. What a beautiful depiction of that in that song, On the Throne. The second song that we sang today. What a beautiful a picture of that scripture, of that verse. And look at verse 2, then it says, So set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. This is talking about a heavenly vision and a heavenly focus that all Christians should have. But when was the last time you thought of heaven and you thought of eternal life this week? We get so distracted by everything going on in this world, don't we? There's just so much going on here, so much to tend to here, that we just lose sight of who we are in Christ Jesus. We lose sight of the heavenly vision. And we need to, notice it says here, it doesn't say that it just happens. It says, no, you need to. You do this. You set your minds on the things above and not on the things of this earth. And look at verse 3. For you have died and your life is hidden in, in, in Christ, in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in his glory. Verse 5, then because of all this, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he makes a list for us here. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And in these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Look what he says there. He says, put them away. Put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and that you have what? You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. 
So then he's going to give us another list here. He's given us the put off list. He's told us to put off the old self, put on the new self. Now he's going to tell us what to do. In verse 12, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And, and, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all of these, put on what? Put on love, which binds everything together. Love is the factor here that binds all of these other good deeds and these other actions together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the, Lord of, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word, something that you speak, or indeed something that you take action on, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now I want you to think about this put off and this put on a set of lists that he gives us here. If you live the life of the put-off list and all of those things that he listed there, what kind of witness will you have? What kind of witness would you be for? If you wear those things and you do those things, you'd be a witness for the world. You'd be a witness to evil. You'd be a witness and a testimony for walking in darkness. Then he gives us the put-on list, and if you look at all of those qualities and those characteristics, it's the put-on list because this is the kind of witness we should have in Christ Jesus. And it is possible to walk in those ways and to live in those ways if you call Jesus Savior and Lord, and if you will yield your life and your heart and your spirit to him. And so this is really about our witness. It's about our testimony. Last week we talked about speaking our testimonies. This is the part of living out your testimony. And sometimes we just need to acknowledge that we have to we have to acknowledge that we need to slay the sins that so easily entangle us. Let's look at the put-off list first. The put-off list lists sexual immorality and impurity and passion. And that's not talking about like a passion for God. It's talking about a passion for worldliness and a, and a passion for lust. It says evil desire, covetousness, idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, and lying. Then he gives us the put-on list. Compassionate hearts. Kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, above all, love. Remember, he said love binds all these together. Then he goes on, he talks about peace and thankfulness and teaching and admonishing one another. You see, we have to live our lives in a way that reflects this put on list. And that's why the Apostle Paul is telling us to take action here. He's saying put off the old life and put on the new. It begs a question for us this morning, though. How do we take steps to shed the sinfulness that potentially compromises our witness? What do we need to do? What's our part in this? To take steps to shed the sinfulness that potentially compromises our witness and our testimony to the world. I want to share some thoughts with you this morning. One of the first things that we need to, that we need to do is to take this step of having honest awareness. Having honest awareness. You see, honesty is when you take a look at your life. And you, if you take a look long enough and you are honest enough in your mind, you will see that there might be sinfulness in certain areas of, of our lives. And it is important as Christians, as believers, that we become aware of our sins because I think there's a lot of Christians that don't. A lot of Christians that don't want to look at those parts of their lives. A lot of Christians that, that maybe they have no awareness of how their sinfulness is destroying their witness. You know, we have a lot of new Christians in the church, and this is the way it should be if you're reaching out to the lost and dying world. And sometimes as, as, as seasoned Christians, I think we need to remind ourselves that new Christians, they're not fully sanctified yet. They're in a process, but they're in a process where we should see progress, just like we're supposed to be seeing progress in our own lives. One of those times that uh, I, I saw this at work, I remember I was uh, actually on vacation uh, with my family, and I was in Dallas. This was uh, probably about 10 years ago. And I remember we had a, a newer uh, Christian um, come to the faith. She came to the faith. I had the privilege of baptizing her. And I remember uh, just being on vacation. I, I very, very rarely do social media, but I remember being on Facebook and seeing some posts 
um, that she was putting and some things that were coming up from the past, from the old way of life, from you know, her list of the old self. And I remember thinking, even as a pastor, and even as someone who had just baptized her, um, you know, fresh out of the waters of baptism, maybe six weeks before, do I, as a Christian, just as a Christian, not as a pastor, but just as a Christian, do I say something to her about this? Do I say something to her about this, these lifestyle choices from the past, and how it seems like we're almost celebrating those on Facebook, or remembering some of these, some of this old life, and, and, and it involved alcohol, and it involved partying, and involved involved some vulgarity, some obscene talk, as it says in the scripture today, and how she should be putting off those things and putting on those things. And I decided to address it. And I did it, you know, the real the real way that I probably shouldn't is I addressed it in an email. You know, it would have been a lot better the phone call in hindsight, but I addressed it in an email. And I remember it was late at night when I sent it, but I had prayed over it, and I felt like God had said, I need to address this with her, and I did, and I sent it, and I remember thinking, I may never see her at church ever again. But I just stepped over the line, because maybe she's already become, after six weeks, a private Christian. Private Christians, we don't, we don't let other people know about our life, you know, and, and, and that's, that's judging me. If you, if you point out something that I need to improve on, um, instead of seeing that as a challenge or seeing that as an act of love, no, we take it as an act of offense, and I thought, wow, I may have just lost her, I don't know. So I went to bed praying about it, and I remember the next day I got up and, and checked my email. Sure enough, first thing in the morning, she'd sent me an email, and I remember fearing to read the, the text of the email, thinking, Okay, what's it going to say? You know, I thought, you, I thought you were a caring, you know, pastor and, you know, but I just, I just had pointed out some things in her post and she said, thank you for, for bringing that to my attention. You're right. That isn't who I am anymore. And what was amazing is within 24 hours as I went back to her Facebook page, she not only had not posted those and kind of erased those current, she had gone back about three years in her post and deleted everything. Now that's a person that says, I'm putting off the old self. And I'm going to put on the new self. And how do you think, not only my respect for her as a Christian sister, six weeks old by the way, uh, a Christian sister, but also as a witness and a testimony to the power of God in her life, was made so evident. Now was she sacrificing some, some memories out there? Yeah, she, she really was. I mean, that stuff, all those pictures and all those parties and all those events are, are gone now. But I think she realized, like I felt in my heart, which was, that's not who you are anymore. That's, that's not who you're called to be anymore. Because we need to put off that old life and to put on this new life. And that's what that list is really all about. And part of that is that we need to become aware of it. See, my, my whole purpose was to make her aware of it. It wasn't to judge her. It wasn't to slam her. It wasn't to discourage her in any way. My whole point was just to point it out, to make her aware of it. And she became honestly aware of it. And I think it grieved her heart. And she realized that is not who God has called me to be now. That is something that represents the past, and I've put on the new self, and I've gotten rid of the old self. And it raised awareness in her life because she was willing to look inside herself and take a moment of honest reflection and have some honest awareness in her life. And the gospel does some excellent work there. And for you, you may say, well, how, how do I do this? I mean, who's that person that's going to speak into my life? Some of us need to give permission for someone to speak into our life like that. Because if we don't have a relationship and someone in the church just says, hey, you know, I, I heard this about you or saw this about you, you know, that, that seems kind of harsh. But that's why it's so important that we be connected to one another, that we have relationships with other Christians, that people can be honest with us, that people can walk up to us and say, I really see that you're struggling in this area and, 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 and with, a, with a heart of, uh, I want to help you out of this. I want to help you glorify Christ. I want to help you do better in this area that you're struggling with, that people would actually come alongside each other in the body of Christ and want to help each other. But if we're going to do our part, we have to be aware of the sinfulness in our lives. And some of us, I think, have become so numb to that. And so you need somebody in your life like that. For some of us, it'll be, your, it'll, it'll be our spouse. I mean, the wonderful thing after uh, being married to Amy for 21 years is that she, she knows me really, really well. And she's gotten just bold enough in the last two, three years to really Tell me some things about myself, you know, at the risk of hurting my feelings, at the risk of maybe uh, being offended at each other for a while. But I've learned that that's real care. I mean, she loves me enough to tell me the truth and to give me some honest awareness of some things in me that God is wanting to work out. 
For some of you, it may not be your spouse. Maybe it's just a really, really good close friend. For some of you, it might be that Sunday school teacher, that small group leader, that ministry team leader that you look up to, that person that that you know is just further along in the walk. You see some of these put-on qualities in their life. For some of you, it may be a strategic accountability partner that you're about to set up. Someone that you're going to say, I want you to ask me every week how I'm doing in this area. But we need honest awareness. The second thing that we need is open confession. Open confession. It keeps us humble. But it also keeps us aware. It's something that Scripture actually commands us to do. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He, being the Lord of God Almighty, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, check this out, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we will confess our sins to Him, if we'll, if we'll acknowledge them, if we'll have an openness to ourselves and openly confess our sins to Him, He is faithful. And not to just forgive our sins, but to cleanse us, to get rid of the old self, from all unrighteousness so that we can put on the new self. And I'm telling you what, if you uh, met a new Christian uh, and, and they seem to be on some kind of a spiritual high or really excited about their walk with Christ, it's because they feel this. They feel this cleanliness. They feel this holiness. They feel this righteousness. And they feel it in a really, really special way. They're really, really excited because of what God has done in their life. Because they have openly confessed their sins. They have openly confessed that they believe in Jesus Christ, that they call Him Savior and Lord. They have openly confessed, and probably in front of the, the church, or at least in front of a group of friends, that they have been in the watery grave of baptism. They've been raised to walk in that newness of life. And because of that confession... It means that they've opened themselves up to God even more. We're also called to confess our sins to one another. In James chapter 5, 16, it says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. So we're not all actually just, just trying to be a private Christian and I only confess my sins to God. I don't confess my sins to anyone else. We're actually called in Scripture to confess our sins to one another, to other Christians, to other friends. So maybe, again, your spouse, your accountability partner, some, somebody that you look up to, but you're called to confess your sins to one another so that we can know how to pray better for one another, so we can know better how to support one another, so we can help each other put off that old stuff and to put on the new that Christ brings to us. Open confession. How well do you do that? How well have you done that? I think if we look around, how well has God's church done that? That we would actually have an atmosphere where we can openly confess our sins. And know that that doesn't mean that, that we're going to be um, judged and, and condemned, but that brothers and sisters in Christ are going to encourage us and pray for us and help us deliver us out of that old pattern in life. And so we need these things, honest awareness, open confession. The third thing that I think we need is purposeful commitment. We need purposeful commitment. This gives us this idea of actively actively seeking the help of God and our brothers and sisters to help repair the issues in our life. That this is something that's going to be purposeful and we're committed to getting better, getting healthier, more surrendered to God, less selfish Less of going our own way, more of going God's way. That the fruit of the Spirit would be on the increase of our lives. That the old life would be on the decrease. That means that we need more word in our life, more prayer in our life, more study in our life. We need to commit to be in the presence of things that are holy. Because it's easier to be sanctified there than to be in the presence of things that are unholy or that are pulling us away from God. You see, when we're in the presence of holy, it's harder to sin there. But when we're, we put ourselves in these circumstances where it's easy to sin, maybe it's with a certain group of people, or maybe it's going to a certain location, that it seems like that's where we compromise our witness. That's where we lose our testimony. And maybe we would make a purposeful commitment that we're not going to do that anymore. That by the grace of God we stand that we don't need to do that anymore. Let me tell you this morning, if you feel like, yeah, that's where I'm at, that's where I need to go, that's my next step to following Christ, then I would like to introduce you to the word repentance. 
Because repentance is a great way to a new start. You know, for years, I, I believe in the church, and I had this view as a child and even into my teenage years, that repentance of your sins meant that you felt sorry for your sins. That you would actually be convicted, you know, by Scripture, uh, be, be, be convicted in your prayer time, maybe even through a song that's sung, uh, powerful lyrics through a song, would just move your heart and your soul, and you would just, you would become aware of your sinfulness, and you'd feel sorry for that. And for some of us, we feel so guilty in that moment of what we have done against God and what we've done against Christ, that we would cry. And so what church did is, is church has made this repentance time is something where you just feel sorry for your sins and you cry. But the interesting thing about that in Scripture is that we don't ever see crying and feeling guilty associated with repentance, oddly enough. In fact, there's Scripture that says that godly sorrow leads to repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But the rest of that verse says, but worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow can lead us to repentance, which can lead us to salvation, which will leave no regret. But worldly sorrow only brings death. I think that's where a lot of us are, is we felt sorry for our sins. But when we say the word repent in the scriptural meaning of it, in, in the actual context of it, it actually means to change your mind and change your direction. It's actually the, the act of you completely turning your life in a new way, in a new direction. It's like if you're going this way against God and God wants you to go this way, you turn completely and you go that way. You repent of your sins, which means you leave your life of sin and you go God's way and you grow God's way. Repentance is to change your mind, literally. That's what it means. Change your mind what does it say in our scripture today? Think about things above. Don't think about earthly things. Change your mind. Quit being focused so much on earthly things and earthly gains and earthly life. And be focused on things that matter for eternal life. Put off all of those earthly things. Put on all of those heavenly things. But we have to be purposeful and committed to doing this. Make a commitment. Maybe for you today, it's something, it's something that sounds so simple, even though I know it's really hard, that you're not going to gossip anymore. You're not going to talk bad about people behind, your, behind their back. If you find yourself naming somebody and they're not standing there, you're not going to say it anymore. Maybe it's gossip and slander or something like that. That you need an, a friend or, 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 or some type of accountability for it. But you've got to be purposeful in making that commitment and to taking those steps toward God. And so, let's go over them again. Honest awareness. Open confession. Purposeful commitment. These things will help us in our witness to God. And the last thing is clearly naming and sincerely crucifying these sins. When death was arrested in my life began. You may say, why? Why is it important that we would clearly name and sincerely crucify our sins in our life? It's because Jesus died for you and saved you from those sins. And Jesus' death was not in vain. I'll never forget this moment. Youth ministry. I, I remember we were always in the youth room here at the church, which is the threes room now. But this particular night, we were in what we call the big room. And I remember the youth group was there. There's probably 60 to 75 students there, junior high and high school. And I remember our youth minister, his name was Bob Belts. If you've been here for, you know, since the 90s, that might be a name that's familiar to you that you've heard of. I remember Bob was teaching a lesson, and there used to be a cross that hung up on the wall where the screen is in the big room. There was this cross. It was a wooden cross. Now, this is one of those ancient relic crosses, you know, like someone made it, and they constructed it out of special wood. And this was just, you know, this was one of those crosses. You don't mess with this cross, Okay. <laughs> But I remember Bob had brought it down, and he was holding it while he was talking during the lesson. And the point that he was trying to make to us was that when we choose to habitually and continually stay in a sin pattern in our lives, that it's like we're trampling on the cross of Christ. It's like his death and what he sacrificed and what he suffered for means nothing to us. And while he was making that point, he took this cross and he threw it on the ground, and it broke. Now, you talk about a memorable lesson. I have no idea... I have no idea what he said the rest of that lesson. <laughs> All I remember is looking at that cross and thinking, oh, he might be in trouble. 
And I remember looking at his face and how many shades of red it was. And he continues talking, but I have no idea what he's saying because everybody's looking at him going, oh yeah, you're in trouble. (laughs) That cross has been there since I was in the preschool here. You just broke it on the ground. I mean, you could see he was nervous, but we got through the lesson, we got through the prayer time, and I remember Bob goes over there and he's like, woo. And I remember being one of the, just being who I am personality-wise, I walk up to him, I'm like, was that on purpose? Did you... (laughs) Did you just break the the cross that used to hang over the communion table? Because there used to be a table of communion, and it's like, you just broke the cross of Jesus. And, you know, and I remember he, I just remember he was sweating, and he was like, man, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. And so what he did is he took it to a great uh, woodworker. I don't know who who it was. I I, I bet you he knows. Um, But anyway, but I, I just remember they put it back together. You couldn't even tell. That cross hung in the oak. Uh, For several years, I think it's uh, hanging in a wall in the oak somewhere. It was above the stage where that screen is, where we project on the wall over there. Uh, So the cross is still around. It survived and everything. But I do remember the point. The whole point of him taking it down, throwing it on the ground, was because he was frustrated with his kids. He said, you guys are Christian kids. You've already made decisions for Jesus Christ, and yet you're choosing to walk in the old ways. And his call to us was to put off the old ways. To put on the new ways. Look what it says in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Hey, more sin, more grace to cover the sin, right? And the Apostle Paul says, by no means. By no means is is such a strong term. And, And it's with an exclamation point. So he's yelling. By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in that sin any longer? You see, you have to clearly name and sincerely, and I'd say strategically, crucify these sins. Because they have a great effect on your life. But they also have a great effect on the lives of others that are looking at you and saying, okay, you say you know Jesus. You're you're a church person. You call yourself a Christian. But how is your life any different than mine? 